Thank you very much, Charlotte. And yes, I would echo that. If I'd known quite what was coming, I, I wouldn't have said yes. I would have found a good reason to say no, thank you. Um, but I will also echo Janet and say I don't have to pretend to be enthusiastic because actually once we were immersed in it and once we began to understand what it was that we were doing, it did seem like a really good idea. And we did seem to be coming up with something which felt more intuitive and slightly more organic than the tick box approach that preceded it. But the curriculum, I think, as a whole is is an evolving thing. It's like language. It doesn't stay still. It's always changing. What we did is doesn't know what happens now. And what you guys, sorry, that's my doorbell. I'm just going to ignore it. Um, and what, what you guys are doing now probably won't be quite the same as what we're doing in 10 years time as far as the curriculum is concerned, but that doesn't matter. Um, in a way, in a very strange way, the output at the end of it is the same. Um, okay, so I'm probably will repeat a little bit of what what Janet said, um, but we'll go through the slides and hopefully you'll just be able to flesh out some of the more um, uh, the, the skeleton of the things you've perhaps picked up and know already. So as Janet said, a lot of the um, momentum behind this came from the GMC um, and also from a shape of training report, which um, pointed out that people were training in a way that didn't really reflect what was required for the workforce. Um, the GMC's flexibility agenda that Janet mentioned, the GMC said doctors wanting to change between specialties couldn't and that should be wrong. Um, and in 2018 the GMC hosted a number of development workshops uh, to set the ball rolling to get all specialties to review their curricula. And it seemed to me that what they were asking was what do you do? What does your specialty do? And do you really need to do it? Are you really necessary? Um, their starting point was that for your curriculum, you should be able to describe your work and you should be able to justify it, not to build an empire, but because it's what's needed out there in the real world. Next slide, please, Kim. And also, the when we say the curricula didn't really reflect perhaps what happened in the real world, this is just an example from the ONG um, older curriculum. Technical skills made up the vast majority of what we'd learnt. And then once you become a consultant, the clinical part of your job is very small and actually in some ways the easiest part. It's everything else that goes with it um, that the GMC felt, and probably most of us, if, if we're honest, felt that you're not necessarily trained for. You learn how to do things, but you don't learn how to actually inhabit the role of a consultant in your specialty. Um, next slide, please, Kim. So, the little, the non-technical skills, the GMC came up with what they said were generic professional competencies or capabilities, can't remember which one, um, and there was nine of them. And these are things which basically are about being a good doctor. And being a good doctor should be the same in any specialty. These are the sort of the core values and behaviours of all of us when we sit down with a patient or we sit down with a medical issue of any sort um, and we address it. And the GMC felt very strongly that these should be much more obvious in curricula and they should be the same in each curricula. Next slide, please, Kim. So compared to the technical skills versus non-technical skills, I think you'll all be familiar with this lovely diagram. Um, CSRH doesn't lean so heavily towards the technical skills. It does have a much broader range of things that we need to be able to do. So in a way, we were a little bit further ahead and I think that's because we were a newer specialty, so that it reflected the fact that we were perhaps a little bit more in step than people whose curricula have been developed maybe 70, 80 years ago. Next slide, please, Kim. So this slide, you don't, please don't you have to read it all. Um, this is really, I think, a very good demonstration of why it's quite hard to answer that question from the GMC, what do you do? And all of us who spend our lives explaining to people what we do, whether we're trainees or whether we're consultants, it's quite hard to explain to people in a short, pithy and representative sentence or phrase what it is we actually do. And a lot of the work of the curriculum committee and the workshops was about trying to really pin down what we do. And this is kind of what we came up with. And it isn't very short or simple, um, but it was a very, very important first step. Next slide, please, Kim. 
So after the GMC workshops, we sat down and I'm, I'm dubbing 2018. This is a kind of a look back over how we've got to where we've got, because if I tell you our processes for getting to where we've got in the curriculum, hopefully it will, it will reassure you that there isn't anything really different about the content. It's about the way of expressing the content and the way of grouping the content and also weaving in those generic behaviors that the GMC are very keen and I think we should we should have. So we sat down to work out what we actually did and you've got to start at the end and say what we do because that's answering the question as well not just what do you do but are you really necessary what what are you there for and when you turn up to work as a consultant what exactly are you doing and again in SRH it's very varied isn't it we all have slightly different jobs in different areas we have different things going on some people do hysteroscopy some people do SARC some people do medical gynae some people don't do those things any of those things so how do we sort of make um, an all-encompassing representative um sort of plan of what we are trying to aim for and what, what we need from somebody at the end of training. So this is what we came up with. Our highest level outcomes are the four down the left hand side. Clinical expert. Yep, there is that clinical component. We are an NHS professional. We work within the NHS. We have got to work within the systems that we find ourselves in or the trust or the region. Um, we shape services and we champion sexual and reproductive health. We keep on mentioning it, mentioning it. We keep on explaining why we're here and what we do every day to people. Um, and we also do an awful lot of teaching, um, not just ordinary doctor teaching, but we run training programs, all of us. We run general training programs. We run our specialist training programs. And again, because it's a small specialty, a lot of us are educational supervisors. A lot of us, a high proportion of us are TPDs. So we run education and we supervise the education and mentoring of lots of other professionals in our region. And that's quite a part, I think, from our, some of our colleagues. Next slide, please, Kim. And so we, we grouped everything as far as we could um, according to those professional identities. So in 2018, we set out to um outline how we would how we would have the generic professional competencies the gpcs the gmc things um in the curriculum having asked all of you probably at this day two years ago what you felt could go and what could stay and there was a lot of worry at that point because are we really going to butcher the curriculum are we going to chop out everything is abortion care going if they're going to take out forensic sexual assault care what about the people who work in sarks how will they find anybody to replace them when when they're employing new consultants you know that that i think is probably the worst part of all of this where everybody became very worried in case something unrecognizable and awful came out at the end and we cut off all the wrong things and kept all the wrong things preconception care was identified as something that we needed to expand on that we needed to be more explicit about what we did um, and the same with transgender competencies. It wasn't that they weren't in the curriculum, but they weren't very explicit um, and they weren't very well described. And again, that's part of the evolving nature of a curriculum. So it's not just a chance to get rid of dead wood or get rid of things which actually don't reflect what we do, but it's a chance to actually make better the stuff we do do or set it out better. Next slide, please, Kim. And so in order to do these things, we needed the year of the workshop and 2019 um, saw us spending a lot of time um, in London, um, sitting in rooms in the RCOG as it was then, time for a little bit of nostalgia, um, hammering through all these things and talking about what would be our capabilities in practice. And Janet's description that a capability in practice, a SIP, um, is the amalgamation of lots of competencies. It's, it's doing something by um, sort of almost unconsciously drawing in lots of other skills that you've got, both practical skills, but also communication skills and um, values, the whole lot. What would be our capabilities in practice? So we started off from our identities and then we tried to group our modules into the identities. And then we worked out um, how our capabilities in practice would come out of those modules. So we had to sort of just go backwards. And what you're then trying to do is fit in the old jigsaw pieces 
um, into the new picture that you're making. And some of it fits in quite well and some of it just doesn't quite fit in. And that's where it becomes difficult. Where are you going to put things? There are certain things which can go anywhere. And in some ways, it's not a right and wrong way to do this. That It's where you want to put it and where it feels like it's best. And we tended to do it by consensus. If people felt strongly about something and could justify that, then we would put it put that thing there. Um, but yeah, there are always different ways we could have done it. And we can't change the way we've arranged it now, um, but we think we've done the best job that we could. So when you've got your capabilities in practice, you then break those down into your component key skills, keeping your elbows high, breathing at the right time, turning your head in the right direction so that you get through that swimming pool as quickly as you possibly can. Um, and the key skills underneath each SIP, you must get your mind away from thinking of practical skills because the key skills are not the practical things you're doing. They are simply the key skills that you use in doing that SIP. Now, practical skills might come into it, but we're now calling them practical procedures so that they are completely separate from skills, which could be a whole variety of things. And we also worked our way through the program of assessment um, and the exams team uh, came in at that point um, having done their reviews of the exams. Next slide, please, Kim. So we took our SIPs, we, they roughly correlate to the learning outcomes from the old curriculum. And then the key skills roughly correlate with clinical competencies. Now, just saying this, some of you who are not as really familiar as I now am with the curriculum, both the old and the new, perhaps that doesn't mean very much, but I've got a slide, a couple of slides which will show you what I mean by this. If, if you're worrying, where did this come from and did you just make this up from scratch? No, we didn't. Um, and descriptors are roughly taken from professional skills and attitudes. Um, next slide, please, Kim. So just to take SIP1 as an example, this is a generic SIP, obviously, this is one that's going to be, there'll be something similar to this in the surgical curriculum, in the medical curriculum, in the, in the public health curriculum, every curriculum will have a SIP that is like this or something equivalent. And this is just your basic doctoring, you can sit down with somebody, you can use the knowledge you've got, your clinical skills, and you can provide patient care by deploying these skills. So what are the skills? You can take a history, you can examine someone and you can investigate them so that's your first key skill so as you see it's not necessarily a practical skill it's one of the things you do when you're giving medical treatment and help to people you're going to and for us I thought it was important that we um, emphasize communication because I think that's a key part of what we do it, subtle communication facilitating people to communicate back with us that's terrible English sorry Kim um, people have got to say things to us which are difficult to say out loud or difficult to even hear themselves say and so we need to be very good at both communicating and listening um, then given having had that sort of high level of communication we then provide treatment and within that we understand all our legal and ethical obligations um, to keep us safe and to keep us right so that's SIP1, um, and you can find the bits in the old curriculum. So if we go on to the next one, Kim. So that's how the old curriculum looked. So you've got a learning outcome there that's history taking. Um, you've got clinical competencies in the second, in the second box, um, and then you've got your professional skills and attitudes. So don't worry too much about the training support and the evidence assessment. That's the sorts of things you would use as evidence and the training support of what can you use to help you learn these things? You know, where are you going to go to find teaching on it or to find some sort of um, resource? Uh, next slide, please, Kim. So this is the same thing, but what I've done is highlighted how I took bits or how we took bits and then transposed them. So the yellow ones in this particular case became part of the key skills. Um, and then the blue bits became the descriptors and the pink bits wouldn't, don't necessarily fit in in any particular place, but we feel that they're represented and that we haven't lost them. And one of the things Vinette in particular was very hot on was we're not going to lose any bits. And if we don't use bits, we're going to keep them marked so that we can make sure they are covered somehow or other somewhere. Um, and if we do lose a bit, we've got to justify why we're losing it. It has to be a deliberate loss, not just an omission. And then the green bits down the left hand side are the knowledge criteria. And I will come on to that. The knowledge criteria is all the detail of what you need to know. OK, but that doesn't really that's not really the curriculum. The curriculum is a is a more generic statement of who we are, what we do and what we're training to do. When it comes to what facts do I have to learn? 
that's the knowledge criteria, a bit like your sort of textbook that runs alongside the curriculum. Next slide, please, Kim. So without worrying too much about all that detail, the professional identities are what we're going to become at the end, which hopefully reflects all of us who've qualified and are working, what we do roughly, more or less. The capabilities in practice are what are going to be assessed in the ARCP. The key skills are the sorts of things that the trainees are learning on a day to day basis and to bring them all together by the end of training to be able to say that the capabilities in practice are being done at consultant level. And the descriptors are simply there to help you. They're not exhaustive. They're just there to give you a, a, a steer on the right road. So trainees will be concentrating on key skills as well as practical procedures, which are part of the key skills, but not all of them by any means. Um, and capabilities in practice are the focus really for the ARCP. Next slide, please, Kim. Um, so the professional identities were our high level learning outcomes, these four areas. And what we thought about is the NHS professional um, is, is, the, is the sort of the basic generic one. And then we thought that we would, we would sum up what we do as design, deliver, train. You know, we, um, design design is part of the strategic overview of helping to plan services, the work we do with public health um, on a regional and strategic level. And then deliver is delivering the care and training is training others. So we quite like the design, deliver, train. So if you see that around, that's where that's come from. Next slide, please, Kim. So we did a first lot of SIPs. Am I doing all right for time? Kim, you can give me a thumbs up if I'm doing all right for time. Have I got to? Yes. Just, just give me a big thumbs down if I need to stop. Um, so the first SIPs, we came up with 12, 12 SIPs. So our NHS professional identity, that's our basic doctoring, um, getting it right as a doctor. We've got six there. And then in our specialty specific uh, SIPs, we came up with two clinical SIPs. And again, just bear with me. We're telling the story from the beginning and going through it step by step. And then professional identity, um, Sorry, systems leader and champion is seven, um, SIP seven and eight. That's our strategic overview with public health. And then nine and 10 was our um, clinical ones. And we split, we kept GU as something separate and we kept the sort of the, the women's healthcare bit sort of within SIP nine. Um, and then as educator trainer, we had two. We had sort of small learning and big learning, if you like, um, managing educational programs and teaching individuals. So we had 12. Next, please, Kim. So in 2020, we had the year of submission. So that was when Vinette went to work in the Ministry of Defence. I'm sure she misses us terribly and wishes she was back with us. Um, and Kim came galloping to our rescue. And what we had to try and do was pull everything together. Because one of the drawbacks, I would say, of not doing all these Zoom meetings is that not everyone can get to London for every single meeting. And so our progress had been necessarily quite a bit slower. And that slide down in the bottom. Oh, where are we going, Kim? That one was to look at everything we'd done from the workshops and all the output of the workshops and all the feedback that all you guys out there had given us and try and make sense of it all, but changing from one project manager to another. So Kim would say, well, where, where's the final version of SIP 7? And I think, well, I don't know. I can't remember what I did with that. Did I send it somewhere? Did it, Mitesh would have a look through all the files and see if he could find them. And that picture down in the right-hand corner is about, you know, the back of a knitting thing. It's all, where do you tie in all the loose ends? And it's a bit like someone saying, well, did you, did you knit a second arm or did we not got a second arm? Oh, we did have a second arm. Where have you put it? I can't remember. And so it was trying to bring all those things together and at the same time make the big decision that we were going to submit the exams changes at this you know concurrently with with the curriculum changes which was a huge piece of work for the exams committee and quite frightening to say we were going to do it but it was a lo logically sensible thing to do so in 2020 we had more workshops and meetings to try and bring everything back in line ask ourselves why we decided these things in the first place and really really look at your feedback so i would like to reassure you all that everything you've told us and everything you queried and questioned we actually looked at every single thing everything you said and we did think about everything you said and quite a lot of it we used and i have learned that getting feedback even when it's not really what you want to hear is probably one of the best ways of making sure that you deliver a good piece of work that's just my learning um and then when we 
um, had done all of that, it then had to go to our own education strategy board to be ready to submit to the GMC for August. Next slide, please, Kim. And one of the biggest things that people said to us, one of the things that caused a lot of um, questioning was, why have you split the clinical things into two SIPs? Why is gum on its own and everything else in one? And that was a very good question. And I don't think there was a very good answer to it. I think it was just my mindset probably more than anything else. And that sort of lack of querying what you just presume and what you just do in your own head. And so in the end, we thought, well, what, well let's, let's just have a clinical SIP. That's what we do. That's our clinical job. But I didn't like to have 11 SIPs. So which is why I merged the ethical SIP number six into the history taking which I thought was not bad. The ethical SIP was a very small one, and I thought it should start at the beginning of what we did, because I like 10 SIPs, it just seemed to be better. And so some decisions, a few of the decisions are made based on preference like this. So that's why we now have our final 10 SIPs. So we've got five generics rather than six, and one clinical. And that does seem, I think, to sit better. Next slide, please, Kim. So with the programme of assessment, and I, you know, um, it's not entire, although I'm chair of the assessment and curriculum committee, I'm very well aware that the exams part of this is a, is a you know, it's a very big part. Um, and I'm not really qualified or experienced enough to speak about what goes into the exam. But thinking about the assessment of the curriculum, that's something that we looked at very closely as well. And the matrix of progression and at what point should we be thinking of this and what point should we be thinking of that? Um, and we, it was also a chance to actually match the exams to the curriculum, which I don't think had ever really properly been done before. Um, and that is where the knowledge requirement, those things on the left hand side, all the facts that you need to know um, could be really, really fleshed out and made sure that it is useful for the curriculum and also useful to know that if you know all of this, then you're probably well set to be taking the exams. Next slide, please, Kim. The assessment of the training, as opposed to the exams, because the exams will only test some things, and the workplace-based assessments and the assessments of the SIPs are the other part of assessing training. And the GMC want to see that everything has been assessed in some way or another. And Janet alluded to the global assessment of each SIP um, and overall performance. So the we don't want, I've done 20 of these, therefore I'm okay. I've done 13 of these, therefore I'm all right. I've done two of these, therefore I'm not all right. Um, I've learned to do this and now I've got to do 20 every year to prove that I'm still all right. That's that's too, that's too, it's, it doesn't, no, it's not necessary. Um, I think anybody who's my age um, and over will remember your consultant saying to you, yeah, you can do that, off you go. <laughs> that's fine, give me a call if you have a problem. And you'd be left thinking, well, can I? Well, he thinks I can. And no, I say he, he thinks I can. I, all right, I'll do it. Yeah, and that was what it was. And we don't want to be quite like that, but it's more that idea of does this trainee, can this trainee do the SIP or can they perform the SIP, which is this amalgamation of skills? Are they good enough at all the skills to be able to be left to do that clinic whilst I go elsewhere or whilst I do office work or do I have to just sit in with them? Where am I with their overall performance? Um, it's all about Nope, it's all about giving the learner a chance to say whether they think they're competent or not, and that will help them identify what they need to do if they don't feel that they are competent in that SIP. Um, a lot of reflection going on. All the workplace-based assessments, we'll get a chance to look at this in more detail later, have got space for reflect reflection from the trainee. Um, and it is really about how the trainee feels they're doing. And we want quality evidence rather than quantity. And quality evidence should be able to be linkable to lots of different skills because you do one consultation there'll be lots in it so it's getting good value from each bit of training rather than having to do 20 of something okay next please kim so day of submission 14th of august um the CAG form was absolutely gigantic with 33 appendices. We even had a nice special video to celebrate it once it had gone in because it was so huge and it felt like such a relief. And this is where I take my hat off to Kim and Mitesh for sorting it all out, organising it, filing it all, getting all the right versions out. It just blows my mind, frankly. I can come up with a bit of content, but my goodness, my knitting would still be unravelled with sleeves everywhere if it was up to me. 
So, um, yeah, all of this went in. Loads and loads and loads of stuff, but every bit useful, every bit made as good as we could possibly make it. Um, next. And... Yeah, then we had our, we had a, we raised a glass to one another um, when Kim had pressed the button and we'd gone nuclear with it and the GMC had got it. And the, the picture of the dog and cat is a little, again, raising a glass to our curriculum pets and kittens and cats and puppies and babies and any other innocent creatures that arrived and cheered us up during all of this um, as we stared at our screens. Um, and then we got an initial response with some clarifications and corrections with a very quick turnaround time of practically a week. It seemed like two days. You've got to write this stuff and send it back in again. But we did. And the GMC have um, sent us approval subject to just a couple of extra things that we have to do, which are not showstoppers and don't result in any massive change. It's just sort of tweaks, really. Um, and as long as we can reassure them that those things are in hand and, and give them the evidence as we go along, then that's all fine. But they will they will give us the actual go live early next year. Um, it isn't that we go live with it now. Um, they it will, it will be January, February next year. Um, so it doesn't stop there. As Janet said, we've come up for air, but it's to take a gasp to put it in front of everybody again now as it is and to say right to actually get this show on the road how do we how do we help you how do we explain in detail what you're going to do how do we support you doing it and how do we cheer you up that this isn't just an avalanche of work for no reason at all there will be the initial phase of getting used to it and getting a handle on it um but once we've done that i think all of us who've joined in the making of it feel that it's going to be better more intuitive and reflect really who we are and what we do um so i commend the curriculum to you not because of my part in it but because i truly do think it's better in the way it's presented and the way that we will interact with it both as trainees and trainers um than than the version that we have been working with so all sorts of things are in development, SIP guides, which some of you very kindly have already been involved with, um, things for the e-portfolio. Um, we want it to be as accessible as possible. Don't ask me about IT, but you'll be able to get it on any screen or whatever screen will be helpful to you. Um, the knowledge requirement is something which, again, is going to be very helpful. Um, and we will all be around to support transitioning as we go through the first ARCP. And we're human beings. We're not going to fail people because little things have you know, or misunderstandings have been made. Next slide, please, Kim. Do we have another slide? I think we have one more. We're almost there. Because the next slide actually is one of my favorites. I'm stuck. <laughs> I don't know what's Ooh. happened here. The suspense. It's a really good slide, this one, Kim. You can't... I know. It's the best. <laughs> if you're not going to remember any of the slides, this one that's just coming up is, is a very helpful one. What I'm going to do is stop showing my screen for a minute. Yeah. Come back. I just wanted to say, Catherine, thank you. I think we're very fortunate to have such a clear vision and to have the needs of training addressed in such a sympathetic and practical way. Um, and you've just reminded me how far we've come over the last year. Um, we're in a very different place to when we were when we had this meeting last year, when I remember throwing gold coins, well, you know, chocolate ones, to people who <laughs> recognise the acronyms within the curriculum. Um, <laughs> So I think you know, we've massively moved forward. Kim, have we got our next slide? Um, no, I'm having. A, I'm going to have to shut this presentation down a minute. I'm sorry about I this. Again. Okay. It's, no. it's just a very nice summary of what has changed and what hasn't changed, just to reassure people that we hope we've kept all the very best bits, but what we're actually doing is presenting ourselves kind of succinctly and accurately. So... Can I just 
ask everybody whilst we've got a, a short break is just to say in terms of questions if you have got questions um then please to put them in the chat and hopefully either Matesha or i will record them so that we can come back to them um so oh that one hopefully. what has not changed oh no it loves this one doesn't it oh that's it hooray good this is a very good one just to finish on before we get on to questions and points in the chat um so the training program is still six years and it still has the same progression waypoints it will still have workplace based assessments that you recognize that are called the same thing and the clinical content except for the real sort of practical doing of the forensic gynecology is the same you still have got to have an understanding of forensic gynecology and all the principles of it but you just don't have to have actually done it um, and the idea is that you could upskill to do this if you're going to get a job in which a SARC, um, in, SARC skills were required. And the e-portfolio, we're staying with the same provider, and that's really good. And I think our next speaker will um, perhaps allude to how it's not so good if you have to change your e-portfolio provider at the same time. Um, procedures haven't changed. They're just separate and parallel, and ARCPs will be the same. So what has changed is you don't have to keep on and on and on um, with more OSATs to demonstrate continuing competency in the matrix, which is a relief, I think. Obviously, if you feel you need to, uh, if you need to do something to maintain, then you do it. You discuss it with your educational supervisor and you do it. That's the thing about being an adult learner. We want quality, not quantity. Um, we want lots of talking between trainees and supervisors. And now that we can all do Zoom teams and everything else, that shouldn't be as much of a problem as it might have been in the past. And we've updated, as I said, preconceptual counselling, transgender um, competencies, and global assessment, that overall professional judgment, which you're all very good at, whether you know it or not. It's one of your generic doctoring skills. You're now going to use it as a trainee, as a trainer. Um, and the assessment of non-technical skills, in which I've said in SRH, we've probably lent more towards anyway. So I think we were already in that direction. So that's it. Don't be worried. Yes, an initial an initial adaptation phase, which will be a little bit messy around the edges, but I'm I think you will I think it will it's worth doing and yes, enjoy everybody. Thank you. <laughs>